Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining. Cheryl, Arthur, Diane. We're just getting a few things wrapped up on our end, and we'll jump right in. We'll have Mick McGurr from Focus Law hopping in on in a few minutes here. All right. Also, we're streaming live to Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, type in your question. We'll be here to answer them for you if you have any questions for Mick. And I'm just going to get my slideshow up here in a minute. Let's see, Lucy's in. Thank you, thank you for coming in. We're gonna just give it a minute. Let let our guests hop on. Let Facebook live stream, and we'll get started here in a minute. So, in the meantime, I'm Mike Del Pre, Executive Director of the Arizona Real Estate Investing Association, also known as ASRIA. And today, we're going to be talking everything about LLCs. Whether you're just getting started, or if you're advanced, is well versed in real estate laws, and he's going to be able to answer any questions that you may have. So yes, glad glad to be here. Thank you, Cheryl. Glad to have you. This is something that we'll be doing every single week. Every week, we'll have a, a different topic to discuss on real estate investing. I'll bring in some of our business associates from here to other professionals locally here in Arizona that can help us help us out in our real estate investing businesses. So like I said, I'm just waiting for my slides here to load up, and I will get them going. Perfect. And here we go. Mix here. All right. Mix in here. Can everyone see my screen? Can I get a thumbs up? Does it look good? Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Welcome to Azria. Once again, Arizona Real Estate Investing Association. Our mission here is to educate, support, and inform real estate investors throughout Arizona. We have chapters in Northern Arizona, Southern Arizona, all across the state. We've been supporting your real estate business and we're your you know, best friend when it comes to your business for the last 20 years. So actually, this is our 20th anniversary in this November. We'll have a celebration for being two decades of representing investors. So we're really excited about that. You could always go to our website. We're on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Check out any of the social media platforms that, that you work on. We're most likely there. Just for everyone being here, just want to let you know that we do have an opportunity where you could be a, become a member. That's $100 a year to be an ASRIA member. So very low cost plenty of benefits. If you're not going to be active in this business, just only come to a couple meetings here and there, hundred bucks for the year, right? So, but the, the thing about that is you just have to pay a la carte. So per event you go to, you have to pay for. So subgroup meetings that when we have like our fix and flip group, our landlord group, our beginners group, it's just five bucks to go. The main meetings, 10 bucks. But if you're going to be highly active in the business, we do have our plus membership, which is only $239 for the year. If you're highly active, going to all the events as much as you can, just absorbing everything, taking advantage of the networking opportunities, all the subgroups and the smaller events are free. So $239 gets you access, whether it's standard or plus, the $239 gets you access to all benefits that ESRI has to offer. And one of the main ones that we have to offer here is the Home Depot program. You get 2% back on your purchases. You get 20% off all the paint programs. 10% off cabinets and all these other special discounts you get for being a member of ASRIA. So if you have any questions about that, we have videos online or you can call the front desk and we'll make sure that you're set up properly. We also have coming up here, we have our monthly, our monthly meeting, which only in July and December, it's online for all chapters. So this July, summertime, things kind of slow down. So we do the monthly meeting online. We go do, we do our market update. We do the fix and flip update and the rental up, updates, so we'll let you know what's going on around the association. And we do the have and want se session, which we usually do at the Phoenix Real Estate Club. So we'll do that all online, July 11th, Monday night. Otherwise, after that, our monthly meetings are always at Venue 8600 in Scottsdale. It's a big event. All our business associates are there. Our mar market update happens. So there's usually two, 300 people. So we'd love to have you join us the second Monday of every month. All right. Is that it? Let's see. And all right, what we got coming up August 13th, we have Jack Bosch, he flips land. So this is a great opportunity to figure out how to flip land. You can do this from home and virtually. I, 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 although I can do virtual, I do virtual investing myself. I feel that, you know, I don't like when people say, do it from your pajamas. However, here with land flipping, I really do think you can do it from your pajamas because this way there's no house to see right? It's just land. Google Google Maps does wonders these days. So you can see the land. The owners are usually out of state or not living there, obviously. So everything happens over the phone. 
Jack's been mastering this for over 15 years. So he's going to be spending a full day with us Saturday, August 13th. Here it is, Rhea, telling you how to flip land virtually. Let's see, why do I keep doing that here? So then he'll also be with us that week, Wednesday, August 10th. And he's going to explain to you how you can use the seller financing strategy and leverage the homeowner to do this with little to no money down and maybe have them carry the property for, you know, short term or long term. So he's going to go into detail how to do that. We also have uh, as Rhea show podcast on all platforms. You could check out the on Spotify, Apple, Google Play, YouTube. As Rhea show we've been doing for about a year and a half now. We just started rolling it out weekly. We had special guest Steve Trang of the Real Estate Disruptors podcast, the largest real estate investing podcast in the nation. So he's going to be working with Azria a lot now. So very excited. So if you'd like to get to know Steve a little bit better, check out episode 28. And Mick, are you are you on? Are you on the call? Yes, sir. What's up, buddy? How you doing, man? Good, man. How are you doing? Thanks for taking time out of your day to be with us. For those, I know we had a few people just recently join. Once again, this is called Not Another Lunch and Learn. Every Wednesday at 12 p.m. to 1 p.m., we're going to bring a special guest like Mick to talk in depth about a specific subject around real estate investing. There's no charge for this. We're streaming on Facebook. We're going to open it up to Q&A. There's, it's, it's really low key. We don't have any specific plans here today, Mick and I. We just know that we want real estate investors here at Azria and around Arizona to understand the importance of having an LLC. And I figured there's no better person to have but Mick to answer all those questions. So I did put together a bunch of questions for him and we'll just have a good conversation. And uh, there's definitely, like I said, if you have questions, put them in the comment. I'll ask Mick for you as well as uh, we'll, we'll maybe open up to discussion, you know, towards the end of, of this event. So mm, you want to jump in, Mick? Tell us about yourself. Tell us who you are. Who's Focus Love? What have you been up to? Sure thing, man. Actually, what I'm trying to do right now while I'm, I'm talking to you is trying to figure out how to share Oh, there we go. I'm going to share real quick what we have going on here to the Focus Law page as well. So bear with me for one second while I <coughs> click through. Uh, yeah, no worries. How to do it's these fun. things? Sorry, guys. So, so we have Jamie's on. Thanks for being here, Diane, Arthur, Rosa, Cheryl, Lucy. Thanks for all being here. Appreciate it. And, and Rosa, Rosa, and Molly are work here at uh, Azria. Molly is our operations man manager. Rosa's head of membership services. So they're here to support us. So they'll be in the chat answering any of our questions. So are you good, Mick? I am, yeah, great. <clears throat> Real quick breakdown of who I am. I've probably met quite a few of you guys. My name is Mick McGurr. I'm an attorney. I've been practicing for a little over 10 years, I believe. Started out a few regional firms. <clears throat> and then about coming up on six years, I started Focus Law with the intention of being able to cater to small to medium-sized businesses, investors, kind of getting you guys the quality of representation that you would normally get, the quality of, of legal knowledge and, and whatnot that you'd normally get from a large law firm, but the hands-on, one-on-one type of relationship that you would normally have with a much more boutique firm. So um, got a good group of attorneys here with me now. We love what we do. Uh, we represent um, a lot of investors. Obviously, that's why we're involved with Azria. Um, you know, Mike and I have done a lot of work together and we love what Azria is all about. And so that's why I'm here to support and to help you guys wherever we can. Awesome. And thank you. Yeah, Mick, you guys have been a business associate for a few years now. Like, like he already said, he's helped out a lot of members. Love to talk to you. They look forward to seeing you at the monthly meeting. So it's always great great to see. So you want to just dive right in and start talking LLCs? Yeah, man, let's do that. All right. Awesome, man. So I'm just going to keep it, keep it very simple. Some snowball questions at first, just kind of like, what is a real estate LLC? What is that entity? What, what is it? And why do we need to have it? Sure. So first question, the first thing I'm going to address is what does LLC stand for? It's a limited liability company. An LLC is a business entity type created by statute. So every state, all 50 states have set up laws that say, hey, if you want to have a limited liability company, here's the laws that, you're, that those are governed by. Each state's a little bit different. Obviously, Focus Law is is licensed here in Arizona and California, but we kind of do work throughout the United States. And so if you set up an LLC here in Arizona, it'll be recognized in all of their 50 states. You might need to register as a foreign entity there, but limited liability company, it's a way for you to conduct business. Really where the LLC came from was there was two options before. First option was you're either a sole proprietor. That means it was just 
Mick out there doing business as Mick McGurr, you know, taking care of things on his own. And with that, there was a lot of exposure. There wasn't any real tax benefits. There was nothing like that. The alternative previously was only that you could be a corporation. Incorporation comes with a lot of regulatory regulatory complexity, a lot of rules and procedures. It was very difficult for a small business to comply with the obligations of being a corporation. So actually, I believe it was about 40 years ago now, various states started putting together limited liability companies with the goal of bridging that gap making it so you have a place where as a small business owner, you can have some liability protection and some of the benefits that you would get from having an entity, but without having the uh, regulatory stricture and, and pain in the butt of having a corporation. So that's what an LLC is. Real estate LLC is just one that you're using for your various investment endeavors. Love it. Great. So, so we got the LLC set up. You said a couple of things there. So you could have your LLC. I could do business with my Arizona LLC. Let's say I'm out of state investing and I'm, I'm buying property in other states. So I could operate there. However, I have to be with that state, sign up as a foreign LLC, you said? Right. You can register your entity as a foreign entity in any other state. We've done quite a few of those. A few folks have come to us recently with out of state LLCs, New Mexico LLCs, Nevada LLCs, Washington state LLCs. And they say, hey, I don't want to set up a new LLC. And so we've kind of domesticated that LLC to Arizona, registered it here as a foreign entity. One of the reasons that you would do that rather than just setting up an LLC in whatever state it was, or if you have an out-of-state LLC registering it here, one of the reasons you do that is you have an established history with that business already. And so by registering it here, maybe it's that you have financing that, for, that depends upon the fact that you have a, a history or a track record with that existing entity. Got it. Okay. So yeah, I didn't even look at it like that. So yeah. So if you're coming to Arizona to invest and you have a New Mexico LLC, you you know, make it a foreign LLC here. And is there, do you ever see that? Like, is there any changes you need to make to the LLC to comply with other states or here? No, most states will accept at face value those entities that have been set up by other states. That's why, you know, we have the, the anonymity that comes with things like a Wyoming LLC or a Delaware LLC, Arizona requires public record of those different things. But if you've got an LLC in Delaware or in Wyoming and you use it here, Arizona doesn't require a lot of extra reporting and whatnot um, like they would for an Arizona LLC. So that's not an advertisement to go out and use a Wyoming or Delaware LLC yeah. because the benefit's pretty limited. But if you already have one, we can do it here without many changes. So since you're on that topic, you know, because people do push that idea, go to Nevada, go to Wyoming, go to Delaware. Why do they say that? There's different reasons. There's a, well, Delaware has a great history for business entities. They have a very streamlined business court. The public filings are pretty limited. And so there's a few layers that people would have to go through. If they're trying to sue you and they want to sue your LLC, they'd have to go through a few steps to get who you actually are. Wyoming, same thing. They're anonymous entities. And so people wouldn't see that, you know, Mike is the owner of Mike LLC. They, you know, have to do a bit of searching. Now, with that said, anybody that files suit and that subpoenas that information would be able to get it. So the anonymity thing is pretty limited. People sometimes say Nevada. The reason for Nevada is it used to be that Nevada's process was very simple. There was no registration fees on an annual basis and all that. Well, Arizona no longer has any annual registration fees or anything else. There's no there's no obligation to keep your LLC current in Arizona. So if you're trying to avoid recurring costs related to an LLC, Arizona is about as good as it gets for that. Got it. All right. So when it comes, so one, one thing I, I wanted to like make this session about is I wanted to let people know that how they can get an LLC themselves, right? Like they can do, they can actually go out and create the LLC by going, is it, can you kind of walk through the process of yeah, sure. how simple it is to just yeah. get an LLC? If you go on to the Arizona Corporation Commission website, they have a portal called eCorp. And through eCorp, you go in, you enter some various information, identifying information, your name, you, you reserve the name of the entity, you uh, enter those things. And at the end of it, for I believe the fee is 35 plus a $50 surcharge or vice versa, whichever it is, uh, for about 85 bucks, you can end up with your own LLC that you've set up. The process is really quite straightforward, pretty simple. So if you're just truly looking to get an LLC, 
it's pretty cheap, pretty easy. There are some pitfalls there. You, you know, if you've, if you've never done it before, if you're not thinking through the different processes, it is a wise idea to sometimes, you know, consult with an attorney or with somebody who's more familiar with the process because there are certain things in setting it up and structuring and everything else that you won't necessarily think about. And we'll get to that conversation a little later yeah. as well with what's an operating agreement, why is that important? But truly, if you're just looking to say, I'm Mick, I want Mick LLC, I'm the only member, that's all it is, you can go on and have it done in about 25 minutes. Yeah, and I wanted to make sure we yeah, briefly just went over that because you know, Heritage Rio, a lot of people come through our doors and some people might not have the budget yet or, and but they might have a deal on their hands. And I just want to make sure everyone understands it's important. I mean, when we can let me segue into that, the importance of having an LLC or you're buying a property with an LLC. I don't want anyone to not, I don't want anyone to get in trouble or mess anything up by not having an LLC because they, they don't have the budget for it yet or whatever it may be, right? Or whether it's wholesaling, whatever you're operating in. So what are some, some of those things they would have to look out for sure. if they don't have an LLC? So the pitfalls of not having an LLC. First of all, <clears throat> the whole concept of an LLC is if you have it and you're using it for business and you get sued, it's not you getting sued, it's the LLC getting sued. So whatever is in the LLC has exposure but anything outside of it, you know, if you've worked your whole life for your retirement accounts and for, you know, for or not even retirement accounts, for your savings and everything else, you have your property, you've, you know, got a lot of equity there. If you get sued on an investment property and you don't have an LLC, anything that you have can be used to satisfy a judgment that would result against you. That's a little bit of legalese, but imagine somebody falls on your property, they break their neck, their family sues and the property, your rental was in your name. They get to sue Mick McGurr and they get to go after any of Mick McGurr's assets in order to, to satisfy their, their judgment. If it's a you know $3 million judgment against me, that might exceed my renter's policy I had on the property. It might exceed any of those other things. So first and biggest reason, the biggest pitfall of not having an LLC would be that you would have a lot of additional exposure. The second reason to have an LLC is, well, the second risk of not having an LLC is that there's a lack of structure amongst the investors. Maybe it's just you. And if that's the case, that's fine. You don't need much structure there. But quite often, it's not just you. Quite often, it's you and a partner or you and, and somebody else here you're both putting in 50-50 on. And having an LLC is going to give you, well, you wouldn't have that structure if you didn't have the LLC. So the LLC kind of spells out what your obligations to each other are. One kind of bucket of liability that people don't often think about is the non-slip and fall, non-accident, non-insurance covered liability that you might have that, that could happen. One example I can think of that happened at a firm that actually one of the folks that I work with here, Sam and I, we work together. And a lot of times folks will buy investment properties, the rental properties in HOAs. And once in a while you get sued by the HOA Sometimes it's for you know unpaid dues, but oftentimes it's for you did something to the property. You think you have the right to do it. They think that you don't, so they sue you. There's this ongoing litigation. You're fighting for your rights, and especially if you think about you know in, in times of uh, when the market isn't quite as high as it is right now, it's not unheard of for an HOA lawsuit to end up with a hundred thousand dollars in legal fees stacked wow. up in that case. It, it happens all the time. Having worked for a firm that represented some HOAs, I've seen it. And so if you think about it, if you have a $75,000 condo and you get sued by the HOA, $100,000 legal fees, and they win, well, now not only do they get to foreclose against the condo, but if that property is held in your personal name rather than an LLC, they get to satisfy that judgment against your personal assets. So it's not a slip and fall. It's not something that you're normally thinking of. It's just kind of litigation that sometimes happens with business. But in this instance, you could end up with a massive legal fee that ends up being reconciled against your personal asset. Wow, a lot of a lot of stuff there. It, yeah. Is what what about some how about some of the good stuff? The good <laughs> stuff is first of all, this is like my favorite. It, it sounds yeah. silly, but legitimacy. You have mm -hmm. no idea how many times if you're going out and you're just trying to find a deal and you put, you know, a note on somebody's door and say, hey, I'm, I'm Mick and I want to buy your house. A lot of times people say, sounds like a scam, sounds like a joker. If, if you're, you know, Mick's Investments LLC 
it, the legitimacy that comes with it, Mike, you can speak to this probably better than I can, yeah. but the legitimacy is real. Also with lenders, lenders look at it and say, okay, so wait, you've never bought a home before. You know, you never, you never done an investment property before. You're brand new to this. They're going to look at you with a little bit more of a scoff. If you just show up as you individually trying to get a hard money loan to do a fix and flip, then they would, if you show up with an LLC, with an operating agreement, there's that legitimacy that kind of comes with having that. And it's a big one. It's, it's a real help for sure. It definitely is. Even when you go to like outside of hard money loans, like DSCR loans or, or just the bank, they always, one thing I always notice is they want to know if we're in good standing. So when you have an LLC, how do you keep that in good standing? How do, cause that, can that be a problem in the future? If we just get our LLC today and never do anything again, like how do we maintain it and keep it in good, good, good record? So the answer is easy. There's almost no requirement for oh, Arizona okay. LLC. The only requirement is if you have a statutory agent, what well, we can talk, let's talk about that real quick. Statutory okay. agent, one of the things you'll need to fill out when you do your LLC online. All of that means is by law for your LLC to be valid, you have to have somewhere that lawsuits or other legal filings can be served on you. So you can be your own statutory agent. That's fine. But imagine you're in your house right now, you set up your LLC, 10 years down the road, you've probably moved a couple times, you know, depending upon mm -hmm. what station of life you're at, you know, and somebody goes to serve you with a lawsuit for your LLC and you haven't updated your address. In that instance, your LLC, as soon as they report that you are not able to be found at that address, your LLC is invalid. Mm -hmm. So you can reinstate it by updating your, your statutory agent, but that's one of those things where if you move, if you do it, you know, if you, if you, don't have a relationship with the attorney that you have as your statutory agent. You don't know if they're going to be moving offices or whatever else. You want to make sure your statutory agent is current. That is really the only major component in keeping your LLC active, according to Arizona Corporation Commission. Got it. Because that's that's so I could see that being when you like you said one of the pitfalls when doing it yourself, right? You're you're going to put your own name and address to keep it simple. I it may recommend to put someone else on there, but uh, most people just put their personal info and. I know I've, ch I've changed my office multiple times over the years and I got, I could see that. One of the nice things with using more established business or, or person to, to be your statutory agent, for instance, if you were to use focus law is that I've got, you know, I've registered, I mean, I, I don't even know the number, probably a thousand LLCs, maybe more than that. So mm -hmm. I, whatever it is. And as a statutory agent, anytime that I go to move my firm or if I go to, you know, change office locations or whatever else, it's easy. I go in, I click one button, it says update statutory agent information. And even though you're not doing it on your end, if, I, if I'm your stat agent and I move offices, I can update my address in one place on my portal. And that updates it for all of the entities that I am appointed as a stat agent for. Oh, wow. Awesome. All right. Well, hey, we got a question. Jonathan has a question here. How easy or expensive is it to update your LLC address? Very simple. Again, you go through the process on the corporation commission. It would be amending. If it's just the address, I think that it's actually a revision, not an amendment. In, in any case, whichever one it is, I think it's a $35 filing fee. And the only thing that you will need to do, I believe, is that usually whatever information you put into the Corporation Commission on eCorp, they'll use that to create the form that's needed. But with an amendment to the Articles of Organization, which I believe your address is one of those, you'll need to just type out a paragraph that says the members, you know, duly consent to having the address of their LLC updated. You've amended it and it's done. So it's uh, probably a 20 minute process and a few clicks of the mouse and maybe a $35 fee. Awesome. Perfect. All right. That was good, Jonathan. Awesome. And just for everyone, I know we're live on Facebook here on Zoom. If you're on Facebook and you're just chiming in, my name is Mike Del Pre, Executive Director of the Arizona Real Estate Investing Association. I have my good friend and business associate, Mick McGurr from Focus Law. We're talking everything LLCs. So if you have any questions, chime in into the comments. We'll get your questions answered. Or you can always go to azria.org and you know register for these weekly events so you can be a part of the, the Zoom call and get anything that we provide, PDFs or whatever it may be. So awesome. Great question, Jonathan. I appreciate that. So I think you mentioned, before we jump on to any the benefit, I wanted to talk about the benefits. Is there any tax benefits or anything along those lines we should know about? So it's a little easier to for tax purposes to pile in some of the expenses related to running a rental property or a or, or an investment property. It's easier to pile those in 
and maybe, and I'm not going to say pat it. I'm not doing anything illegal here, guys, but it's easier mm-hmm. to, to avoid some intrusive looks by the IRS. If you have an LLC, you say, look, if this, the purpose of this LLC is for the maintenance and running of this rental property. You can pile a lot of stuff in there pretty easily and get that as a write-off or, or, or get the benefit of it. It might be a little more difficult to receive if you are just strictly you know, running it as an individual. So there are tax benefits, partially just for the simplicity of bookkeeping as well. It makes it a little easier yeah. to keep it straight what it is. And we'll talk about that a little further down in the conversation, I think. Okay. One thing is you want to remember to maintain or to, to, to be working to create the marketability of the property that you have. If it's an investment property, and Mike, you can probably speak to this better than I can, but people want to see how it cash flows. People want to see how that is. If you're just using, you know, if you're if you're just paying it out of your own pocket and you're not using an LLC, it's a little harder to keep books straight and to substantiate the benefit of owning the property if you're going to sell it to another investor. Exactly. Yeah. The bookkeeping as well. Oh, a question popped in. Lucy, do we need a physical address or can we use a PO box? I'm assuming that's for the statutory or, or the LLC in general? I'm, I'm not Different sure. Different answers, depending on which one it is. Um, for your for your location, you don't need a, you can use a PO box, whatever else you want. For your stat agent, it does need to be an actual physical address. And they'll, you can provide a PO box as well, but there does need to be a physical address because people need to be able to physically serve documents that address. It, Mick, I, you know, I'm just flowing here, man. So if you have any, like any topics that you want to cover or I'm not touching, The only other one that I'd say under the benefits are, you know, we talked about it as a risk, but personal liability protection. This is the number one reason you should be using an LLC. You're protecting what you've, man, I I can't remember. And Mike, it was just as you were coming on when we did our our big weekend presentation, but Mm -hmm. kind of the theme that we had around it is protect what you've built, right? Keep what you've we, we all work so hard, man. I work long days. I don't want somebody to be able to come in off of one investment and wipe out all the work that I've done for me and my family, you know, for the last couple of decades. So that's the that's biggest true. benefit. Keep what's yours. Oh, one second here. I, I should have done that a long time ago, <laughs> but awesome. So great question, Lucy. Thank you so much. So another thing about else, one thing I've heard, was, this was a while back though. Can you sell your LLC? with can. real estate attached to it. You can. And it's kind of just random, but and yeah, Mike, I think you and I, I think you and I had a conversation about this once. Maybe I can't remember if it was you and I or not, but there are some creative things that can be done there. If your LLC owns the property and you didn't want to, for some reason it was going to be difficult to transfer ownership in the property or there, or say maybe you had a bundle of properties that you wanted to kind of sell as one and they're all in the same LLC, you could sell your ownership interest in the LLC and transfer the LLC to another party. And by doing so, you would be transferring the properties as well. I remember you have any little bit of documentation that needs to be done. I would not recommend doing that one on your own. Reach out to Mick. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) for sure. But no, there, there are some really good things that can happen there that can streamline the process and maybe avoid some of the pitfalls that come from some of the harder to transfer properties. Yeah. I remember that was popular. Now that I think about it, when the market was down, and I remember so many foreclosures were happening. Banks started putting deed restrictions. Like, hey, if you're, you can't sell, if you're an investor, you can't sell this property for 90 days or someone can't buy it from you. So they would sell the LLC. So yeah, that thought, I never did it, but I thought that was super creative. It's, it's, it's a creative way to do it. And obviously if you, if you owe on the property, that's one of those moves that you would want to make sure you have your lender kind of in, in the loop on. Got it. So so, all right, cool. So remember, if anyone has any questions, we're really laid back here. Bring them to the chat box. We'll get them answered. Let's if go I into jump in with one, Mike. Yeah. This, this is one of the topics that I get asked about all the time uh, at Azria events, kind of everywhere, is how many properties do we want per LLC? You know, there how you many go. LLCs <laughs> do I need? That sort of thing. Guys, the answer is not one size fits all. It really isn't. And that's for a few different reasons. First, if you're a small or, or beginning investor and you have, I would say if you have less than even 15 or 20 properties, there is a real advantage to having each of those properties in its own LLC. If you think about the potential loss that could come, maybe you only have 10 or $15,000 in equity in each of these deals at different times. You know, there, there's not much there to cover. And say you have five properties that you have 20 grand of equity or 50 grand of equity equity in each, 
and you had all those in the same bucket, if you had all those in the same LLC and you get sued on one of those properties, all the properties in that LLC are exposed. So while you only have 50 grand equity per property, if you can only lose 50 grand in a lawsuit or, or an exposure, you'd rather do that than lose everything that you've done, the 250, you know, the, the whole, all five properties. So as a smaller or, or beginning investor, I would recommend one property per, per LLC. The complication is not very much. We should have, we should have David Hawks on here to, to talk mm -hmm. to us about it, but it's, Tax wise and, and accounting wise, it's still very simple. Each of those are pass throughs. You're still only going to end up with one technical return by the parent company and the structure of it. We can talk about that. You're going to have one holding company. That holding company is the only member of, you know, one, two, three Main Street of, or one, two, three Main Street LLC, one, two, three, you know, Broadway LLC. So if you have, if you've got one bucket for each of your properties, your exposure is only that property, as long as you're keeping good books. So as a small investor, that's the one. I said it's not one size fits all because once you have 30, 40 properties, maybe your risk tolerance goes up a bit. And so you mm -hmm. say, you know what? I can lose two or three properties to avoid the, you know, the, the bookkeeping burden of having a separate set of books for every property or, or whatever it happens to be. So the bigger you get, maybe you end up putting more and more properties into the same bucket, but don't wipe out everything you have by having five properties in one bucket as a person with only five investments. Then even as a uh -oh. big investor, I said it was, I said it was not one size fits all. Even as a big God, investor. I thought we may have lost you there. Oh, you lose me? Am I still here? I, oh, how's it, is it looking good? Is it clear, everybody? Looks good right. for me. Am I good? All right. Yeah, I just froze real quick. I didn't know if that was, but we're good. Let's keep it going. Jonathan Sorry, guys. Says, 50K in equities versus $85 for an LLC is a no-brainer. Correct. Amen. Amen. <laughs> for sure. Uh, so even as a larger investor, there are reasons to hold maybe certain assets in their own LLC. One of those is not every investment is the same. Some are high risk, some are low risk. If you hit a high risk investment and you say, hey, I want to do this, the reward could be great, but the risk is also great. And you have 50 properties and you're putting five per bucket at that point. That one that's high risk, maybe pull that into its own LLC so you don't put the other opportunities at risk just based on the fact that you lump them all together. One other is if you're trying to create a very marketable, I talked about this a little bit earlier. If you have a, a, a certain investment, you got 150 properties, you got this one investment that you really want to be able to market well down the line, having its own set of returns, having it, its own books, having its own LLC can make that property more marketable or easier to market depending upon what it is. So it's not one size fits all, put one per property, one LLC per property when you're starting out and then keep that strategy in mind as you get bigger. Yeah. And, and as you get bigger, you know, you're going to want to have counsel, you know, because as you do more deals, which is, this is all good. It's part of the growing process. So I know sometimes when you're first starting, you think attorney, you're like, oh my God, it's so expensive or you get nervous or whatever, maybe. But I found that having a good relationship with a real estate attorney is, is the greatest thing. So also, man, I know I probably want to, because time flies. So I do want to touch on the operating agreement, the importance of it. What is it? Because I noticed when, you know, I, I tried, when I first started an LLC and I wanted to do the, you know, paid 85 bucks, get it done. I messed it up, right? I didn't know, like, because I knew you had to like, you got to put your ad in a paper, right? You know, and I didn't do the ad right or something got rejected. So, but then there's an operating agreement. I'm like, where do you even get the operate? What is an operating agreement? Where do you get the operating agreement? So can you, what is the operating agreement? As operating agreement is probably the most important topic that I get asked about in this particular realm. Your operating agreement is your rules to the game. It's what spells out everything about it. Now, if you don't have an operating, let's start out with, if there's no operating agreement, what governs your LLC? Well, then it's the statutes. Then it's the Arizona revised statutes that talk about LLCs. And there's irony there because they, they call it a limited liability company. But if you look at the statute, the statute implies a lot of liability on the business owner. Okay. So if you just, if you say, I want an operating agreement, I'm just going to go off of what the Arizona revised statutes say you're going to have some exposure that you wouldn't expect to have as a limited liability company owner, both outward toward you know those who you deal with on the outside and also amongst your partners. If you have more than one partner in an LLC 
and you default to the ARS, so the, the statute, your liability to those other partners is a lot higher than you might expect. So without an operating agreement, you just have the statutes and that's, you know, you'd go off that. But having an operating agreement allows you to cater all of that to your desires. The most important things discussed in an operating agreement, first of all, who are the parties to the operating agreement? Who are the members of the LLC? Talks about what the relationship and the obligation of each of those parties is to each other. Okay, so say you're a 70% owner and I'm a 30% owner, Mike. We, we mm -hmm. want to talk about there's some inequity there amongst us. We want to talk about how that's handled. Do I get an equal vote with you? Do you get, you know, do you get a majority vote every time? How do we addre address those? Or if we're 50-50, what happens if we both say we want something different? How do we create a tiebreaker there? It's funny, guys. In the operating agreement, you can choose tiebreakers however you want. I've got clients that came to me and said, Mick, you know, there's six of us. If there's a tiebreaker, we want to have this group assigned heads and that group assigned tails. And the tiebreaker was always a flip of a coin on, wow. on major decisions. And for them, it was just, you know what, we're all agreeing. This is, this is what we're agreeing to right now. We, want, we don't want to end up in a deadlock where we have to dissolve the company. So let's have a guaranteed tiebreaker built in. So wow. talk about how those relationships are managed. And one of the other big parts of an LLC operating agreement is the buy-sell provision. If you want to get out of your LLC, how are you able to do that? Are you able to force the other parties to buy you out? If you are, what are the terms of that buyout? You know, you don't want to be able to hold somebody hostage to buy you out on terms they don't agree to. So you negotiate those things in the front end. Now for simple LLCs, our buy-sell provisions look very similar. They're basically, okay, if Mike and I are in business and I want to get out, Mike can make me an offer. I can make him an offer. If he rejects it, he basically can turn any offer on its head. If I say, Mike, I'll buy you out for $20,000 and it's a formal offer and Mike says, forget you, man, but I get to buy you out for $20,000 because you made that offer to me. You know, so there's, there's, there, there are things we build in to require good faith negotiation in that buy sell process. So things like that. Back to it. The other big thing is you can opt out of all of those statutes. So we talked about, you know, there are statutes that say that there's a very high level of obligation from one member to another. You know, I don't like that. Frankly, I think that if I'm an if I'm an educated investor and I have another individual who's an educated investor, we don't want to have a high level of obligation of uh, to each other. We want to be able to do our own deals. We want to be able to to handle things on our own and not have to report everything back to the LLC just because we're working on one job together. And so you can opt out of those different obligations that are created by the by the statutes. And and for the people that are just going to you know go out and, and start an LLC on their own, where do they get an operating agreement? Mick McGurr, Focus Law. <laughs> there you go. Call Mick. <laughs> Tell him you're with Ezria. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Two questions, Mick, we got here. So first one came in from Diane. Can a partner be added to an existing LLC at a later date, or does a new LLC need to be created? Great, great, great question, Diane. You can add or change partners at any time. There are two things that govern that. One is you have to update the corporation commission when you add or remove a partner. Two is what do the terms of the operating agreement say about adding or removing partners? Say again, Mike and I are in business together and Mike wants to throw in his buddy who I think is a really bad guy. When you're drafting your operating agreement, you want to include provisions that says Mike can't just, just add whoever he wants. We have unanimous consent on adding a third party. So if Mike says, I want to add in, you know, bad Bob, and I say, I don't like bad Bob, I get to opt out of that. Or maybe Mike is a 70% owner. And so there isn't a 100% obligation, un unanimous obligation to the members. Maybe Mike is a 70% owner, drafts into the operating agreement. If I want to add somebody, I, you know, majority and in interest gets to add somebody if they want to. So there's different ways of addressing it, but you can do it at any point, as long as you comply with the statutory requirements and the operating agreement. Yeah, great question. Even my my personal experience, like I said, months into the business, I had an LLC I started. I actually, you know, I messed it up first, like I said, and then I I think I hired like a doc prep company to do it for me. And so I had an LLC, it was my wife and I, and then I found a mentor, business partner a few months down the road. And, you know, we started, we brought him on to the LLC. So not knowing nothing, right? So we were 50-50 partners on the handshake. 
brought him on the LLC as 33% because my wife was on there with me as well. Don't know the reasoning, don't even remember. So long story short, we do business, everything's great. One day things go wrong, right? And you decide to part ways, then everyone forgets everything. So that, you know, so when it came to the breaking up of all the debts and leases and whatever it is, guess who owns 66% of everything? <laughs> that was me, right? Like, but our handshake was 50, 50, but I did, cause I went through a doc prep company. Didn't, no one guided me through nothing. No one gave me th things to think about. That's what I got stuck with. So yeah, that's my operating agreement story. So that the rules are in there and they have to be clear. So another question, Galen, what's up, buddy? Sorry, late question. You have, let's see, you have a property in an LLC. It has a large amount of equity. Can you write a note against that property and hold the note in another company in order to make the property appear to have no or little equity? So <clears throat> there, are, there are provisions that prevent fraudulent transfers. And if you did that for the purpose of avoiding creditors, then there's a good chance when that creditor sued, they would be able to wipe out the note that's held by the other company. If they're held by the same entity, right? Or if they're held by the same individual, if Galen writes a note for Galen LLC one against the property of Galen LLC two, and it's clear there was actually no exchange of value there, you know, that you didn't actually give 300 grand in exchange for a $300,000 note, they're going to look at that and say, it's probably a fraudulent transfer. So there is, there are things that can be done with it, but they have to be legitimate in order to truly gain you the benefit of protection. Great, great answer. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> All right. Next question, Jonathan. Hey, Mick, what is your average charging fee to help write, review an operating agreement? Sure. So there's two answers there. One, you guys are on an event right now. And so you guys get the benefit of the Azria deal, which I'll let Mike explain a little bit about that. We work together on, on, on making a package that makes it super cheap for Azria. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. Makes it super cheap for Azria members to get it done. There it is. That, look at that screen. There's the website. 385, you get a custom operating agreement that I basically get my best operating agreement, but simplified. And for what it's worth, guys, when you're looking at that 385, you don't get to get on the phone with Mick a hundred times to talk about it and anything else. This is for a simple, straightforward process. If you want to, you know, have a, an extended consultation or anything else, then you engage me separately from that. But that 385 is, Mike, is the best deal you and I saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were, yeah. yeah, we researched like we legal Zoom, which you would get no communication with anybody online submission i think they're we're actually a little bit cheaper than after they do all their upsells and i think your final product is above 400 yeah and this is actually coming from a law firm i mean at the end of the day you do you end up with a relationship with me and my staff because we're the ones that deliver it we're the ones that communicate with you through that process but if you have a more complex operating agreement if you if it's not attached to having asria and focus law jointly prepare an entity for you um, i do it on an hourly basis I have folks, I mean, I can, you know, talk to my phone's been blown up this whole time. We actually have, mm -hmm. I represent a number of, of lenders on commercial deals <laughs> and we've got four closings all happening this week on a few really complex transactions. And one of them is an investment deal that they're looking into actually buying into on one of the properties they lent on. And the operating agreement is 170 pages and it's you know, super complex. So on those, I just charge my hourly rate for the actual work I have into it. Hourly rates, 300 an hour. It could be, you know, 10 minutes or it could be, you know, 25 hours, just depending upon how complex it is. Awesome. So, yeah. So as, as, as we have members, right, we, we represent real estate investors, right? We are here to support and be your best friend through your journey and your career. So we have be local benefits. We have national benefits that can support your business. And this is one of them, uh, one of the relationships we have. So we know the importance of an LLC. That's why we wanted to do this today. To give everyone education, answer your questions. So keep, we have a few more minutes. If you want to bring in any last questions, whether you're on Facebook or here on Zoom, we'll get those questions answered. But we don't want you running your business or out there without protecting yourself. So yeah, so throw in your, any last questions, go to azria.org forward slash LLC to purchase the LLC if that's what you need. If you have any questions, reach out to the front desk. Or if you end up booking time with, with Mick, just let him know you're with Azria so he knows about the program. Can we review this recording on the site? Half of it. <laughs> so <laughs> half of it, right? So yes. However, 
it's streaming live on Facebook, so I should be able to grab the entire entire recording. But I'm sure we'll have Mick on again regardless. So on Facebook, it will be there for sure. I don't. This is our first lunch and learn, so we don't have a full plan. We're just we're just taking action. So I'm sure we'll have it on our website. Um, uh, Molly, if you're there, maybe we can. If you're registered, we could probably just email you any, I'll download the recording from Facebook and we can maybe email it to everybody. That can be something we, we, I don't mind doing. I also put together, let's see if I have it up here. I don't see it. We also put together a six step PDF for everybody, to how to do an LLC on your own. So we'll automatically, we'll, just, we'll send you the video and the six step PDF if you registered how to start an LLC, give you all the links and everything where you need to go as well. So. Question here, can you pull up mixed slide again? Yes, I will do that. If if just starting in wholesaling, do I need an LLC to start or more if flipping properties and buying holds? So as a wholesaler, should I have an LLC? Yeah. Cheryl, that's an awesome question. And the answer is yes, you should have one. Realistically, guys, anything that you're doing in business and investing, you are better off having an LLC that you use as the face of that. <clears throat> Obviously, Cheryl, people want to know Cheryl, they want to do that. And that's not what I'm trying to get away from. My only thing that I'm saying is do not, don't do business outside of your LLC because the second that you do, you're exposing your personal assets. Because Yeah, think about it, Cheryl, you know, you get a contract with a homeowner, you assign your interest, right? You sell your interest in that document. Things could still go wrong, buyer, seller, right? Make, I don't know, can they come... And say, I didn't know this. I didn't just accuse you of something. Yeah. So there you go. Right. And you didn't even buy a property or touch it or ever go there. <laughs> in that instance, just, just for what it's worth in that instance, especially as a wholesaler, say you have no assets in your LLC and they come back and say, man, you know what? Cheryl LLC who wholesaled this to me, I'm suing you and you've got no assets. It is as easy as you know that you're not in the wrong and I'm not encouraging being irresponsible, but in that, in that case, you can say, no problem. I'm not gonna do business as Cheryl LLC anymore. I walk away. They can sue you all they want as Cheryl LLC and they can't do anything. But if if you wholesale that under your personal name, you can't walk away from it like that. Wow, great. And, and another thing that's making me think about, Mick, is the separation of LLCs, right? Because as you grow as real estate investors, hey, you might wholesale a couple deals a year. You might be buying some rentals. Should we separate those, right? You don't yeah. want to be wholesaling with your rental property yep. LLC, right? Yeah. Or, fix, or fix and flip either. What do you think on that? I agree. I, I Again, I would separate out your ventures as much as I can in different LLCs because maybe one wholesale deal that you only made, you know, 2000 bucks on could put a jeopardy, a fix and flip that you have 250 grand in equity in you know, so keep your wholesale separate, keep your, you know, to the extent that you can keep your, now you could do all your wholesales in the same LLC. I'm not saying mm -hmm. have a different Correct. LLC for every wholesale. I'm saying for your investment properties, put them in their own buckets so that they're not at risk from the others. Awesome. Lucy says, thanks so much for all this information. Thank you for being here. Thanks everyone for being here. Thanks Mick for sure for providing all the great information. Any last questions? We got about five minutes left. I want to, I know Mick's busy. I know everyone else is busy. So make sure to get those questions in. And, and like I said, we're going to do this every single Wednesday, live virtual on Zoom. So head to Ezria.org, either become a member or also just at least just register on the website. If you're not ready to become a member, you can still access our forums and our real estate calculators and everything we have to offer. Most, most importantly, go to Ezria.org and check out the or forward slash calendar to see all the upcoming events that we have every month to support you. So once again, every Wednesday, check out the calendar to register or just go to Facebook. We'll have a new topic every week to dive in like this. So I appreciate that. Any, any last words? No, guys, I'm excited for each of you as investors. If I can be of assistance, please reach out. I saw somebody up there say that they had reached out for a consultation or something. Look forward to talking to you. And please, yeah, look forward to work with each of you. The biggest thing, Mike, is guys, take advantage of that, of that Azria LLC offer. I, if you go through my website and do the same thing, what is the price? Is it six fifty on there, Mike? I think that's what it yeah, was, yeah. right? So yeah, exactly. It, it's a smoking deal. Mike and I have talked about this one, or maybe, I, I think maybe it was Mike and I or Dom and I, but guys, you build in so many expenses into each of your deals. You know, you build in, you know, insurance policies, everything else. 
Having an LLC is the best way you can protect yourself from exposure and it costs 385 bucks. Build it in as a cost of doing business on, you know, just put it in your spreadsheet as an expense and, and, and be able to rest easy. Yep. And then the timing on this, right. You, we, I think the average turnaround for most places is like, was it 10 days or more, two weeks? Yeah. Yep. And I think we committed to get it or you committed to get it done in eight days. Yeah. Was it? I'm pretty sure. So you're also going to get the LLC faster. Obviously, yes, we, there are parts of the program where we do upsell like the EIN, right? It's very easy. We show you on this website how to do it yourself. But if you, if Mick staff or Mick himself has to do it, there is a charge for that. If you want to expedite it within 48 hours, there is a charge for that, which does happen because sometimes you're in the middle of a deal, you get a new partner or something switches up. Mick could jump in and get that done while you're in escrow and get that LLC completed. So Bunch of stuff there. So any any last questions before we wrap this up? And I'll go back to Mick's contact information here as well. Here's how you get old of Mick if you need anything. Otherwise, I'm good. I really appreciate it. This is our first one. It was great. A lot of participants. And I look forward to seeing everyone next week. I guess we're good, Mick. Mike, well done, man. I, I don't think that I don't know that Azria really realizes how fortunate they are to have you heading it all up, man. They, the, the stuff that Mike it. is bringing, the, the value here is huge, guys. Definitely take advantage of it to every to the greatest extent you can because these are things that you would pay a lot of money to go through a course or whatever else, and you're getting it all for free through Azria. So thank you so much for, for, for that. And I'll reach out to you. I'll text you a little bit later, just kind of recap if that's okay. Yep. And that's it. Everyone have a wonderful day. Be productive. Go out there. Close some deals. Love it. Thanks, folks. Take it easy.